In Middle-earth's final century of the Third Age beyond the looming threat of Sauron, two other formidable powers existed, the Balrog lurking in the depths of Moria and the dragon Smaug residing within the Lonely Mountain, each held their own dominion. This raises an intriguing question. Could these three mighty entities have ever formed an alliance, or was the notion of their union beyond the realm of possibility? Hello everyone, and welcome to Middle-Earth Tales. I am Dragon. Today, I will cover why Sauron did not form an alliance with the Balrog, or bring it under his command. To fully grasp the pivotal events at the Third Age's conclusion, it's essential to journey back through time, all the way to the First Age. It was then that the Valinor finally resolved to confront the dark force of Melkor in a monumental clash. This cataclysmic conflict known as the War of Wrath resulted in Melkor being defeated, imprisoned, and cast into the void beyond the world with his forces largely decimated. Yet amidst this chaos, remnants of his army survived. Orcs among his minions not only escaped destruction, but continued to breed and multiply in the subsequent ages. Dragons, too, managed to flee retreating to remote northern realms. Save for one notable exception, these dragons remained in seclusion away from the southern lands. Another of Melkor's formidable lieutenants, a Balrog, later known as Durin's Bane, eluded capture and remained hidden for millennia. Melkor's most notorious lieutenant Sauron also escaped destruction. After Melkor's defeat, he appealed to Ionwe, Valinor's chief commander for clemency. Despite Ionwe advising him to face the Valar's judgment in the Valinor, he fled, fearing their wrath, and hid in secrecy. This act marked the beginning of his resurgence, paving the way for the Third Age's turbulent events. During the Second Age, the Balrog and the Dragons were notably absent from the unfolding events. As the Age drew to a close, Sauron suffered a significant defeat. He lost both the One Ring and his physical form. Nevertheless, his spirit endured, potent enough to make a gradual return. It took a full millennium for him to resurface. By the thousandth year of the Third Age, he had covertly established himself in Dol Guldur, although he kept his presence hidden. Meanwhile, the Balrog, having eluded capture since the First Age, retreated to the depths of the Misty Mountains, these mountains raised by its former master, Melkor. It was through these secret ways, known only to the nameless things, that the Balrog found a secluded refuge entering a state of dormancy. It wasn't until the year 1980 of the Third Age, roughly a thousand years after Sauron's re-emergence, that the Balrog was inadvertently awakened by dwarves delving deep into the mountains. Upon awakening, the Balrog unleashed its wrath upon the dwarves, resulting in their slaughter and the Balrog's subsequent dominion over the ancient dwarf realm. This leads us to the first crucial question. Was Sauron aware of the Balrog's existence? It is highly probable. The timeline suggests that the Balrog stirred from its slumber in Moria a thousand years after the Dark Lord's return to Dol Guldur. During this millennium, he was not only regaining his power, but also organizing his forces, including orcs, the Nazgul, and allies like the Easterlings. Although initially he might not have known of the Balrog's reappearance, it's plausible he eventually did, particularly through the orcs inhabiting Moria, who were evidently aware of the Balrog's presence. Why then, particularly after the White Council's assault on Dol Guldur revealed his true nature and led to his retreat to Mordor, did the Sauron not pursue an alliance with the Balrog? This era was a critical juncture, signaling that war would determine the ultimate outcome. An alliance with the Balrog, combining its immense strength with his forces, could have offered a tactical edge in impending conflicts potentially, allowing him to easily subdue areas such as Lothlorien or wreak havoc on Lonely Mountain. This leads to the second question. Could Sauron had the capability to enlist the Balrog, another Maya, into his service? Could he have exerted command over the Balrog? 
they both originating from the order of Maiar, shared this fundamental identity. Each Maya possessed unique abilities and varying degrees of strength. Sauron by many accounts was one of the most powerful of them, but a significant factor played into this equation. He had infused a considerable portion of his power into the One Ring, which, at this time, he did not possess. This loss of the One Ring implies that Sauron's capacity to exert dominion over other powerful beings like a Balrog was considerably weakened. Unlike his approach with the dwarves, where he sent emissaries to demand allegiance or threaten subjugation, such a tactic was not feasible with the Balrog. He lacked the power to subdue a being of the Balrog's caliber, at least not until he regained the One Ring. Our third question delves into the possibility of Sauron forming a voluntary alliance with the Balrog. Why didn't he choose to incorporate such a significant force into his army? To explore this, it's essential to consider the likelihood of the Balrog, who had seized control of Moria, wanting to align with him. It's known that the two entities were acquainted in the First Age, with Sauron then holding a higher rank, technically placing the Balrog under his command. However, during that era, both served under Melkor, who far surpassed Sauron in power. For the Balrog, now a ruler in its own right within Moria, there was little incentive to abandon its domain to join Sauron's cause. The hierarchical dynamic that once placed Sauron above the Balrog no longer held the same weight. Unlike Maya, such as Saruman, whose actions were fueled by ambition and desire for power, Balrogs appeared to be driven more by an inherent alignment with evil rather than personal aspirations for dominance or control. Therefore, even if he had extended an invitation for an alliance, it's speculative at best whether the Balrog would have been inclined or motivated to accept such an offer. Sauron's decision not to even propose an alliance might not only stem from his lack of power or his knowledge that the Balrog would refuse. As a student of Melkor, he likely learned to manipulate others, whether willingly or not, to serve his own purposes. He might have thought that allowing the Balrog to remain in its place could be as beneficial as having it as an ally. The Balrog, by merely existing in its strategic location, could be incredibly useful. It controlled a key area, and whether or not it directly aided Sauron, and it was an enemy to elves, humans and dwarves who were also Sauron's foes. The beauty of it was that the Balrog didn't need to be an ally to attack these common enemies. The Balrog had seized Khazad-dûm, the most important stronghold of the dwarves, who were among Sauron's ancient enemies. Without Khazad-dûm, Durin's folk were scattered and couldn't regain their former strength something Sauron had a vested interest in preventing, particularly given his special animosity towards Durin's folk since the War of the Elves and Sauron, when they emerged from Khazad-dûm to aid Elrond. Therefore, the Balrog's presence also effectively hindered any resurgence of the Dwarven power. In addition to being a key Dwarven bastion, Moria's strategic value was amplified by its location guarding one of the most critical passes through the Misty Mountains, an alternate route, the High Pass or Caradras, was already under orc surveillance. Even in the absence of these guards, traversing Caradras was treacherous, beset with natural obstacles like heavy snow and storms, not to mention the pass's own sinister disposition. These conditions made it particularly challenging for large movements such as an army's march. A primary concern for Sauron was the potential force that could be marshaled by Elrond of Rivendell. Elrond had proven to be a formidable adversary to him, especially during the Second Age. Any likelihood of Elrond providing reinforcement to Gondor had to be impeded. With the Balrog ensconced in Moria, the crucial Misty Mountains Pass was effectively sealed that any aid from Elrond would have to confront the treacherous Karadhras or navigate through Isengard where Saruman's allegiance lay with Sauron. All these factors might explain why the Dark Lord chose not to seek an alliance with the Balrog, preferring instead to let it remain undisturbed in Moria. 
However, another significant factor likely influenced his decision, one that possibly outweighed all others, his overconfidence in his imminent victory. The once mighty kingdom of Gondor, established by the descendants of Numenor, had waned considerably over millennia, reduced to a mere shadow of its glorious past. In the north, Arnor was entirely obliterated, the dwarves were dispersed, and the elves were in decline. He observing the drastic reduction in the strength of his ancient adversaries since their formidable stance in the Second Age likely underestimated them. So, what incentive did Sauron have to seek an alliance with an entity as ancient and powerful as the Balrog? In his envisaged scenario of a decisive victory over his foes, sharing the spoils of power with a potential ally like the Balrog was counterintuitive to his plans. He was not known for sharing power. His ambition was to dominate, not to co-rule. Besides, allying with the Balrog could eventually backfire. The Balrog, with its own potential aspirations of dominance, could become a formidable adversary to him in the future. Why risk creating a rival by drawing the Balrog out of its lair, especially when it showed no inclination to leave and was inadvertently furthering Sauron's goals by its mere presence in Moria? Therefore, like Shelob, he left the Balrog where it was, and like Shelob, the Balrog failed to play its part. As I often emphasize, keep in mind that these insights represent my personal interpretations. I warmly welcome differing perspectives and additional insights. So if you believe there are aspects I've overlooked, or if you have your own thoughts to share, I'm eager to hear them as well. In the comments, I see some viewers claiming that the videos on my channel are entirely created by AI and that I put no effort into them. This is not true. Yes, I use an AI voice, even though it stubbornly mispronounces some names, because without it, I wouldn't be able to make these videos at all due to certain reasons. I also occasionally use visuals that I create with Midjourney, but the scripts of the videos are not automatically generated by an AI like ChatGPT. They are my own work. I spend about three days working on each video, so I hope you enjoy my videos. If you do, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. Until we meet again, take care and farewell.